Welcome back, everybody, to the Unboxing Judaism Podcast. My name is Rabbi Arya Wolby. And I am Rabbi Yaakov Nagel. Pleasure. It's great to be back here, Rabbi Nagel. The topic today is something which uh, recently, sadly, the reality in the world, there are sometimes tragedies that befall the Jewish people, communities uh, in various parts of the world are affected in different ways. And the question that's very commonly asked is, how do we understand tragedies in Judaism? Uh, God forbid someone dies young. We had a member of our Torch family, Alicia Mayer Cohn, uh, passed away at just six years old. My daughter was his classmate. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that's not only for the Cohn family, but it's a tragedy for the entire Torch family and the entire world. How do we understand such tragedies? Uh, how do we understand tragedies like last week? There were these two uh, young men who were flying uh, a private plane from New York to Cleveland that were in a tragic accident and both passed away, leaving widows, orphans. How do we understand such things? So, Rabbi, guide us. Okay, so of course this is one of the hardest topics to tackle, honestly. And um, not only is it uh, not a new question, it's a question that was asked by some of the, by some, by Moshe Rabbeinu himself. He, uh, wanted to understand the ways of Hashem, the ways of God. How is it that you have a tzaddik, viralo, you have a great man, some great people, some very righteous people, and bad things happen to him? And, uh, and on the flip side, you have a people who seem to be terrible people. And they have the life and they're, and things are going great for them and they don't suffer and everything goes smooth. And it's, uh, it's a very hard question. And how are we to understand this? That we know that God is a just God. We know that God runs the world. We know that nothing's by chance. He has a tremendous Ashkacha Pratis. Everything is divine providence to, to, to an amazing degree. And that is a tenet of our faith. Nevertheless, we're stuck with these questions. I still remember many years ago, I had my grandmother. She passed away at an old age. And uh, she sang that, you know, when I die, I have my questions that I want to ask God. I'm going to pull on his beard and uh, ask him, why did my daughter have to die? Why did this have to happen? Why did that have to happen? I, and um, so the people around her said, you know, that's why he's keeping you here alive so long. He doesn't He's want afraid to be of your questions. He doesn't want to be bothered. <laughs> uh, the thing is, is that of course the 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 core answer, and really, this is something that takes a lot of humility. And that is, is that who told you that we need to understand? Who are we that are given such a tunnel vision of such a small sliver of life to understand? everything that's going on in this world and why God does things. Have some humility. Recognize that God knows what he's doing. God is a loving God. And of course he loves you. And yes, there's a lot of questions that we can't understand, but why would we expect to understand? Why should it be something that we should be able to automatically get and think about it? What kind of world would we live in if everything made perfect sense? The guy was the biggest righteous person had the best life. The guy who was a bad man had a horrible life. If it was that simple, then where would our free choice be? So it's supposed to be difficult to understand. It's supposed to be hard to see. That's the way the world is created, that it shouldn't be perfectly obvious that the righteous get rewarded and no bad things ever befall them. And the bad people get punished. If it, we on that level... Uh, that, that everything's immediate and instantaneous and it happens in such a blatant way, then that takes away our, uh, the most important tenet of why we're here in this world, which is free choice. And free choice takes us to have that we can both, we can even look at this world and think, where is God? That's our way. That's the way that we're able to have free choice. I think that's a very important thing to think about in general. Um, that's the first step. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, talking about understanding how Hashem controls the world and that we need humility, there's no question that we can never understand the ways of Hashem. But the question that people do ask is, okay, God is a merciful God. Kill Rachum Vichanun. Does a merciful God kill children? Does a merciful God allow 
people to be starving in in uh, you know Rwanda or whatever whatever place it is. So you know, obviously the answer is is that Hashem is all merciful. That's true. We don't understand how mercy works. We think and we interpret everything into our own perspective. This is the way I see mercy, so that's the way mercy's got to be for the Almighty as well. But that's not necessarily the right thing. You know, there's a story that's told, and I know that our listeners are not going to all appreciate the story. Because every time I say the story, I have people tell me, oh, Rabbi, that's ridiculous. So there's a story about the Rashash. The Rashash was a was an unbelievable go and a, a brilliant, brilliant man, but he was also a very wealthy man. And in fact, his commentary was written onto the side of the Talmud. You have the, the Agois Rashash. Why? Because he was such a brilliant, righteous person, but also because he was a very wealthy man. And he helped pay for the publication of the Talmud into print form. So that was, I guess, one of the side benefits is that he got his own commentary to be placed into the Talmud. When one morning, one of the great Hasidic masters wakes up a few of his students. He says, quickly, 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 I need you to come onto my chariot. Come onto my, onto my horse and buggy and we need to go immediately, immediately. And they're like, what's going on? Why is the Rebbe waking us up so early in the morning? And the students all pile in. Nine of them pile into the, into the, to the, into the buggy with the rabbi and he tells the driver, go, go. And they start going all the way and it's snowing and it's cold out. And they get to this little, little shack at the end of the city, of the end of the city. And there the Rebbe says to the wagon driver, he says, stop, stop the wagon here. They go into this shack and behold, there's a young couple there that just had a baby. And it wasn't like you have today, you put on a, on a WhatsApp status, Mazel Tov, we had a baby boy, or you put it in the local newspaper or there's an announcement on the radio and the internet on Facebook. It's, it was very difficult for the word to get out and say, at the other end of the city, you know, the Rebbe finds out that there's this little baby that, that, Turns out that baby, the bris, was supposed to be that morning. And the students didn't know this, but the Rebbe walks in and he says, oh, where's the baby? They bring the baby out. They give the baby a bris. They have the little festive meal. And as they're about to walk out to be escorted out by the uh, by the father of the house, he hears a cry from the other room from the mother. He says, hold on a second. He goes to check what's going on. He comes back and tells the Hasidic Rebbe, he says, the baby just died. So the Rebbe says, oh, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. So the students are now even more confused. You know, first is, how did he know about this baby? How did he know about this bris? And now the baby died, and now you're saying Mazel Tov? So the Rebbe explained to the students later, he said that baby was the neshama of the Rashash. When the Rashash came up to the heavens, the heavenly court, and they looked at his life, they said everything was perfect except for one thing. He didn't have a bris on the eighth day for whatever reason. So they said either for that blemish we can put you in purgatory, which is a cleansing, or we send you back. You'll be there for eight days. You have your bris and come back. He says, I want to go back, get the bris done on the eighth day, and then now the Rebbe said the Rashash came to him in a dream and says, this baby is me. Go make sure I have a bris so that I can come back and get my place in the world to come that's deserving of, deserving to me. So now you look at this and you're like, what? This is the most cruel thing in the world. Right? You mean a little eight-day-old baby has his bris and dies and, and, and that's happy? That's exciting? Well, if you look at the big picture and you see that, yes, this baby came to the world for one purpose and that was to reach his perfection. That perfection was, get your bris on the eighth day. That's the perfection. Now, every single one of us has our perfection. Now, we love life. We love the comforts of life, and we love the luxuries of life. We love all of the, you know, Shabbos dinners, and having the own eggs, and having the cholent. And so we love living our lives, and we want it to continue forever and ever. And that's, we, 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 and we're, we're fearful of that final day. But we have to understand that we're here on a mission. I'll just continue one quick little uh, tidbit. My grandfather was once asked by a a world-famous educator. 
He says, how do I explain to my young students that people die young? How do I explain it to them? So my grandfather said, the premise of the question is flawed. The premise of the question should be with an understanding that people come to this world to accomplish a mission. And when that mission is done, the Almighty says, I know it's going to be painful, but this is for the neshama. You see, we're living two worlds. We're living a physical world where we have those emotions and feelings and we're connected to the physical trappings of the world. But then we have a very, very lofty soul that's within us. And that lofty soul is here on a completely different mission. The body is the vehicle that takes that soul from place to place to go. To, to help it fulfill its mission. To help it fulfill its mission. But then we get carried away with the body and we're like, oh, anything that, that interferes with that body living its fullest life to 120 years old to old age is a problem. And that's not true. A body comes here as a vessel to carry this lofty, holy soul and to accomplish a mission. And as soon as God feels that that mission has been completed, he says, okay, now it's time for me to take back that soul, which is what our sages tell us, is a chelek eloka mimal, which is a piece, a part of the Almighty, so to speak. Hashem doesn't have pieces that we take part of, but that's the idea. is The soul that God imbued into humanity, into each individual, that soul is a part of God, and God wants that part back once it's complete. The example I, I gave to, I give to this many times with my students is: imagine you have a gem, and the gem is flawed. The gem is, you know, no stone. As much as every uh, bride likes to believe, every fee, uh, every girl who gets engaged likes to believe that her diamond is perfect. No diamond is perfect. My father worked in diamonds for thirty years. No diamond is perfect, but what you could do, there's actually a special treatment that you can do, and they put in these special chemicals into the diamond, and it removes the imperfections. I think that those that process of enhancing a diamond is tikkun hamidos. We all get a soul which is imperfect. We're all here on a mission that we need to perfect something, and with tikkun hamidos, with perfecting our character traits, we're, we're overcoming anger, we're overcoming arrogance. We're overcoming stubbornness. These are recent traits that we talked about in our Musar Masterclass. By working on perfecting our positive traits, what we do is we're, in, we're enhancing that gem that God gave us. And we're able to brush it and we're able to clean it. And then when that, that gem is sparkling and it's perfect, Hashem says, oh, now I want that gem and I want to put it into my crown. That's what our life is for. So with regarding the tragedies any tragedies, it's one thing when we look at it, like, oh, such a terrible thing. And it is a terrible thing. And it's something that we cry for. It's something that if the family sits and mourns and, and sits shiva for seven days, it's very tragic. It's very sad because it's painful. It's physically painful. But on a spiritual realm, we have to know, we have to recognize that we're all here for a purpose. And this is the time that God decided he wants them back. He wants these people back. And at that moment, Hashem gets his back. He wants his gem back. He wants that gem back in his crown. And of course, we pray for a long life. We say, Chaim Shal Shalom, Chaim Shal Tevo, Chaim Shal Bracha. We ask for this just last Shabbos. We, we, we bench Rosh Chodesh and we ask what? For a long life. And we ask for a good life and for a healthy life and for a successful life. And for a, a life that's filled with, with a pleasant livelihood, with peace, with love, it's great. We're asking for everything. Notwithstanding those prayers, Hashem picks the perfect time where he says, now is time I want you back. So I think the premise of the question needs to be, if we understand that every person has a purpose in this world, then it's easier to understand why some people it's earlier, some people it's later. And Hashem has that control to determine when is the right time. You know, there's a, 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 a Talmudic uh, passage that really discusses this. And uh, it, I'm reminded my wife's grandfather, when his wife passed away, she was 80 years old and they were married 
and they had to raise the family together. They were both orphans, and it was a very they were very very attached to each other. And uh, it was the day of the Leviah, the funeral, and he was talking to his children, and he explained to them. He said, "It's not a sad day; it's a great day. It's a day of, it's this very very special day." And of course, he was extremely attached to his wife. But what he meant to say is, is that a life that was well lived. That's a celebration. That's really a celebration when you have the right perspective. She did the right thing. She raised her family. She was somebody who was so, the, the culmination of that life is not a really, in a sense, it's sad for us because we miss her. But for her, she, she has that life that was so well lived. She accomplished so much in her life. It's a, it's a, it's a great day. It's an awesome day. And it's very important to have that perspective because it's very it's it's what it is. That's what I said. The Talmudic passage it describes when a ship sets sail, everyone waves and says "Hooray, hooray!" But who knows what's going to happen on the way? Who knows? Maybe it's going to get attacked by pirates. Maybe it's going to, you know, get a storm and it might uh, get marooned or something. And just, uh, terrible things might happen. When the ship comes home, there is no fanfare. But that's really what it is. When a person's life starts when a baby's born, we we're all excited. But who knows? There's a lot of questions. Well, how's this life going to be lived? Is it going to be done? You know, is it going to be a good life or is it not? Is this person going to make good choices or not good choices? When a life is over and that's when the ship comes home, sometimes that's a, they, especially if it was a great person, there's something very, very special, something amazing about that day. So again, it's like, a, like we said before, it's something that you really need to recognize we we do have a skewed perspective we f- we value our physicality without recognizing that the physical body is a servant for the soul and it's there to it's not an end be it's not an end unto itself to have a body to feed to continue to enjoy it's yes those things exist and they're important but it's there to serve for a greater purpose and when you recognize that so then a life well lived is something to celebrate, actually. And uh, again, it's tragedies; they do exist, and it's it's you know it's terrible to say, "Oh well, you know, you don't want to be <laughs> cruel to a person who's undergoing tragedies." And we, of course, we miss the people who are alive. They're the ones who really lose out on being with this person. But God has His reasons, and. It's, and, and not only that, it's like you say, it's, it's, it's God, God, we are only given that small picture. So in our, in our, in our eyes, we're sad. That's okay. But let's recognize that there's something, there's a perspective that we're not given, we're not privy to. And that's a very important thing to remember. You know, many people are afraid of death and death is, seems frightening because we love life and life is, is great. It's, limitless and we can do and accomplish so much and do such great things but the minute a a person realizes that we're here for a purpose we're here for a tafket for a specific job we're here to accomplish so then let's get focused let's not let's get busy living not not get busy dying like we mentioned previously in one of the previous uh, unboxing judaism podcasts uh you said so beautifully, Rabbi Nagel, that people are so worried about dying Jewishly. How about living Jewishly? We have to be so concerned. We have to be so uh, worried about living Jewishly and making sure that the choices we make while we are alive are the right ones. And every day of our life should be focused on what am I going to accomplish today to make me more perfect. Uh, you know, a person shouldn't think, well, you know, it might be a good idea for me to not, not to reach my perfection so that God doesn't want me back so fast. But the truth is, what's better? The delight that we say, Shabbos is me'ain olam haba. It is just a little, a little glimpse, a 60th, the Gemara says, of what the world to come is. It's such a delight. It's such a pleasurable experience. And we'll, we'll get in future weeks, we'll talk about why did Hashem create this world to begin with. It's one of the questions that we need to address is like, what does Hashem want from us to begin with? Like, what's the purpose of this whole world? And we'll talk about it. But the, 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 just the, the quick answer is for us to have pleasure.
And what's the greatest pleasure? The greatest pleasure in the world is being close to Hashem. Is to have an uninterrupted relationship with Hashem, to have the vacus, to have a closeness with Hashem. And we can attain that through learning his Torah. We can attain that through keeping his mitzvot. We attain that through the tefillah, the prayer that we that we pray. Through emulating God in his middos. Yeah, all of these are, are, are the tools that we need to express that love and to, to have that connection with Hashem. But not to fear it, not to fear death, because death at the end of the day is the result for everyone. And of course, we want to have a long life and we want to see our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren by their weddings and we want to dance with, all right, that's, that's a great thing. And hopefully Hashem will bless us all to be meriting to that in good health. But that's a side benefit. That's a side benefit. That's not necess- necessarily the purpose of why we're here. We're here to accomplish day by day. We don't know what we were in previous lives. You know, we don't need to get, we have a, our Kabbalist next door, Rabbi Yacobian, where he can talk to us a lot about the reincarnation where our, our souls are recycled. It's a whole different topic. And whether or not we were here previously or were not here previously, I believe we all were. We're all a reincarnation of a previous life. Not a question in my mind. But regardless, we're here for a specific purpose. And every person's purpose is very, very uniquely different. Right. God put us in this world not to just be, to accomplish. And therefore, it's very important to make that the focus and not, you know, it's not just living. It's not just, you know, that's a, I always said about a birthday, you know, a lot of people make a party on a birthday and, uh, I was thought like, well, what, what is exactly is the celebration of a birthday? Like, what are they celebrating? It's, and, and it occurred to me that maybe it's just, we're cheering up the person who, uh, experienced another year of life and, uh, to try and distract him from the fact that he's getting a year closer to dying. <laughs> and it's just to sort of cheer him up instead of, but, but if you think about life as being here with a purpose, then every year is a year where you can have accomplished more. You could have done something with your life, made something of yourself, made it, made an impact in the world in a positive way. That's an amazing thing. I say that a great birthday gift for a baby being born, a birth gift, would be to give a clock that counts down from 120 years. So it starts as the baby's born, it's 119 years, 11 months, and 30 days, and 23 hours, and 59 minutes, and it keeps on counting down. And a baby looks, he grows up, he's eight years old, and he says, oh, I only have 112 years left. I'm, you know, he's 20 years old. He says, I only have 100 years left. I better maximize this time that we have. And essentially, I think these tragedies that we hear are real wake up calls to us. Hashem picks beautiful gems that are in the world and says, okay, I need this as an example. It says that the, the righteous who pass away, the children who pass is an atonement for the generation. And the reason it's an atonement is because it's there to wake us up and to hopefully repent, to hopefully focus our lives and get on the right track so that 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 shock that we all have when we hear about a tragedy is the shock that should hopefully change our trajectory into a positive. Yeah, and, and to suddenly realize, you know what, we're all temporary. We're not here permanently. Let's get to work. We've got work to do. We've got things to accomplish. You know, it's an interesting thing that, you know, God, uh, God originally created man to live forever. But once he sinned, he needed to have a time limit to God's, to, to, to man's life. Because if you live forever and you lose focus, there's no reason to start getting focused. And that's the problem. So we need to have a limit to our life to make sure that we try and use it in the best way possible. That's what it's all about. All right. I think we've uh, answered, hopefully, the question. If anyone, any one of our listeners who gets to 25 minutes into the podcast have any questions, please reach out to us. We'd love to answer your questions in future podcasts. Reach out to us at unboxing at torchweb.org. My name is Rabbi Wolby. Thank you so much for joining us. Such a pleasure. Rabbi Yaakov Nagel signing off. Have a great day and a wonderful Shabbos.